This is Secrets to Win Big, your roadmap to sustained growth. Brought to you by Arjun Sen, founder and CEO of Zen Mango, top brand growth driver and a former Fortune 500 executive who has been called one of the most marketing intelligent minds in the business. Find him at zenmango.com. And now, here's your host, Arjun Sen. Welcome to Secrets to Win Big with Arjun Sen. Hi, this is Arjun. In the business world, I get excited when I work with leaders who are really good in what they do. So look at that to be an x-axis. Then there are a subset of them who have an additional power. And that additional power, look at that to be like a y-axis. And that power is they have fun doing what they do. Working with those individuals who are good at what they do and also have fun is really an incredible opportunity. And then there's the rare group of leaders who also add a third dimension, a Z axis, which is having clarity on the impact they make on their target audiences, on their team, and everyone else. Today, my VIP guest, Rakhi Istrani, plays in all three dimensions. She's good at what she does. She has a lot of fun. But more importantly, she has very clear clarity on the impact she makes on the lives of her stakeholders, one at a time. A little bit background about Rakhi. She is the founder and president of Excel Test, offering prep courses and career guidance and counseling. She's an attorney by profession and also holds an MBA from Rice University. Rakhi has been actively involved in community service activities for most of her life and currently serves as the director of public relations for SEVA International USA, serves on other nonprofit boards and is on the board for State Bar of Texas. She has mentored and coached high school kids for 30 years to become active and productive leaders in their communities. Wow. Rakhi, welcome to Secrets to Win Big. And it's truly a pleasure to have this conversation with you. It's uh, my pleasure to be here. Thank you for this opportunity. So Rakhi, I just want to go straight to the core. Every journey starts with a clear vision. For you to have a career which is evolving, where you keep making impact, as I talked about the third dimension, what is your secret to achieve the vision clarity in everything that you do? So <clears throat> I, I think the, the main thing is, uh, and you know, a lot of this has kind of evolved from working with high school students. I've been working with high school students most of my life, you know, through the company that we had. And um, even as uh, in college, I was a part of a, a camp. I was a camp director for many years uh, that, you know, you kind of see what works and what doesn't work with kids. And I think that that has really kind of helped evolve my own philosophy on life. Right? And the, the, the thing I've learned <clears throat> in order to keep a, a clear vision is that, you know, have an overall goal in mind, but focus on that first step, focus on that first student, focus on that first customer. I love that. But, you know, I have to push you a little bit on that because each one of us go through high school. Very few of us go back to make an impact of others going through high school. So what drove you to commit to a life and career, not only for you and your husband, but also to help high school students? So, y'all, you know, I'll just go back a little bit that when we started this company, uh, you know, Excel Test was started in 2003, but um, my family started a company called Test Masters in 1991 in Texas uh, and that, you know, we really just started with this idea of here's an exam that every student has to take and we can help kids ace it. Right. That was our goal. It's not to, to build this company or to make so much money or to have this many students. It was this idea that here's a project. Here's a challenge. And, you know, we want to 
uh, um, see how do we, you know, it's a puzzle, right? How do we figure it out? And, you know, one thing I've learned is, like I said, every plan, big or small, starts with that first step. And so when we started this, uh, you know, company in 1991, it was this idea of how do we help students ace this SAT? And we went to ourselves, took every exam that was administered by the college board uh, and did a lot of analysis, right? Looking at the exam, looking at how it's structured, looking at the answer choices, you know, what makes an answer choice correct? What makes it incorrect? Uh, and, you know, we created this whole strategy and then we tested it over and over and over again for every student, right? Every student mattered. Uh, and I think that's how everything is, right? Uh, you know, whether we look at the nonprofits that I'm involved with or, um, you know, or even with my own kids, right? Everything is this idea of doing, reviewing, analyzing, doing, reviewing, analyzing over and over and over again until you figure things out, right? The pattern in life, the, you know, the, you know, the strategies that work in terms of uh, accomplishing what you want to accomplish. I feel like my teacher Rakhi is giving me lessons in life because I'm taking notes like crazy. So the first area, I want to go back and touch on three things that you said. One, you hinted about family. So I'm assuming your parents were involved. Can you just tell me a little bit about the inspiration on your parents and the family on starting the journey and how it drives you forward? Sure. So yeah, my parents are a big part of my life. Uh, both my mom and my dad uh, have, uh, in many ways, even at my age today, uh, have taught me that the idea of grounding is very important. Right? I mean, they have, you know, both my brothers and my sister and I, you know, when we take on any big or small thing, actually we check with our parents to make sure that our thinking is correct that we're not reacting in a way that's going to jeopardize who we are or what we want to accomplish or that there are bad consequences that we're not looking at. And so, you know, I think that they've been very instrumental in, in giving us an outside perspective on where we are and where we're headed, uh, but more importantly, on this next step that we're taking. You know, so even when I came out to California and I started Excel Test, my dad was there you know, every step of the way to help me frame the whole uh, setup. I love that. So anytime, my big takeaway is anytime we are ready to take the next big step, whether it's parents or anybody else in our fan club who is ready to help, get the help, because that will help the next step get easier. Second, you talked about quite a few times every student, every person matters. Now businesses, you know, Raki, you and I have seen enough in this world to see that businesses either talk about businesses in average or aggregate. A business talks about 80,240 and I want to increase 10% more, or they talk about average customer fields rates as 4.2 on a five point scale. But what is very unique, what you're talking about is every student matters. So how have you guys in your business at Excel Test set up the business so every student who is every client that matters? So, you know, when we were like this whole company, this whole uh, project, I would say the whole idea uh, really kind of came out of this idea of serving the community, right? I mean, our first class, uh, or even when we came out here, it's this idea that, look, this is our way to make the world a little bit better, right? It's, you know, we're teaching children how to ace an exam, but it was more than that. It's like being this, you know, being what my parents are to me, this grounding, right? You know, giving kids an outside perspective on how to live life, right? And so, you know, oh, there's a story that, uh, that, you know, I remember from when I was younger is this starfish story. It's this idea that there's a, you know, on the beach when the, the tide comes in, it brings all these starfishes and they're out on the beach. And unless they get back into the water, they, de they, they dry up and they die. 
And so you have this boy that's on the beach and he's picking up each starfish and he's throwing it back into the water. And there's tens of thousands of starfish across this beach, but one by one, he's picking them up, throwing them back in the water, picking up. And this man comes up and says that, oh, there's thousands of starfishes on this uh, beach. What, I mean, you're not making any difference. And this boy picks up this one starfish, he looks at it and he throws it in the water and he says, well, it matters to this one. Love that. Okay? And so it's the same thing that if you look at it, our day, like one day in our life is like 87,000 seconds, right? Every, it's 87,000 moments. And, you know, you have to really think about what percentage of those moments in a day are positive for yourself and for everyone around you. And how do you increase that percentage, right? How do you make the next second a positive one, a, a difference in your life and everyone else's life? And that's actually the whole idea behind the company and behind what we're doing or about the nonprofits that we're involved with is how do we make this next second one that contributes to a better world? You know, this is fascinating because I'm trying to connect both the dots that you talked about 87,000 moments. And sometimes it gets very overwhelming. All I need to do is go back to your starfish story and make this moment matter in my life, those around me, and those I'm serving. And I really think on one side, you have showed me the path to wealth is making as many seconds of those 87,000 count but the path to it also is through each second at a time. And my amazing daughter Raka had taught me about the concept of wow, one more. That's all you can do at any point of time. So I want to go to the third thing I had written down, which I really have to push you on that is, you know, you, are, you and your organization started about acing the test. At what point of time do you realize that acing the test is just a path. And you have evolved to helping all these future leaders, future adults excel in life ahead. So your question is at what point did I realize that this was a greater, there was a greater purpose? Yeah, to okay. it? Because I think that exams are just not, you know, it's just one hurdle you're helping them understand. But in the process you are teaching them, any time, time there's a barrier comes, how to leap across, it may not be a physical hurdle, it could be something else. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, the whole idea, like uh, the whole idea behind this came from, you know, my brother had just come back from college. He's like, you know what, we can do this and we can do it better. We can understand this. And this is something that, you know, makes sense. Uh, the first class was held in our, in our home. It was our family, friends, their kids. Uh, we spent a lot of time with them uh, and it was fun, right? We were, you know, figuring out what we should have done in high school, right? What we, you know, surrounded by the noise and surrounded by the chaos that maybe we might have done to a smaller scale, but we had a better perspective. We had an overall perspective that could benefit those children or those kids. You know, we were only a few years older than them. I, at the point at where we started, that maybe like you know, three, four years older than them, uh, they were in this chaos that they're living. They got this drama that's going on in their lives. They have their parents, you know, that maybe don't understand them or, or you know, they're not chilling with them. And so, you know, there was this idea that okay, we can help them on this one exam, or we can help them change their perspective. And actually, all of this became even more important when I had my own kids, right? Like mm -hmm. you know, you talk about Raka, but even with me, right? Like it's like you know, when I deal with kids here at work uh, or in, you know, in the camps, the nonprofit camps and stuff like that, it's like I see them for the snapshot of time, right? I mean, I can tell you what to do with what you're telling me right now. I can advise you on this, but when you have your own kids, you see their way of behaving throughout the day, right? How they're reacting to stuff, how they're, you know, setting things up and, you know, while I might have realized it with the high school kids when I deal with them, but with my own kids, you're like, oh, life is all about the tools that we give them, right? Life is all about the processes that we set, you know, how to eat right, how to, you know, set up study habits, how to react or not react in certain situations. What are those guidelines that can make a huge difference in how they 
act in 10 years or 20 years. It can make the difference between them going up or going down, uh, being happy or being sad, right? It's those small things that you can teach them uh, that become even more important, right? It's this idea of maximum benefit for the least amount of effort, giving them those small steps that take only a few seconds that can make a big difference, right? Brushing your teeth, right? We do that naturally, but everything beyond that. I love that. And you know, what I love is how you connected the dots with when you and your brother, when you guys were in high school, wishing what you had, the tools and the processes, really helped you solve the problem in a very personal way. You also talked about your kids and saw that it's not about just acing the test, but helping them create the habits, the mindset, which sets them up for long-term success. And I really think that whole personal side by looking at yourself and also seeing as a parent, I think that's something big for us to take in the business world is we cannot fake it. Being in the moment does not mean not understanding everything else going on and connecting to that bigger dot, bigger purpose, I think is very important. So a final question before we move from this area is, you started the business at a very early age. Okay. As you have grown with teachers and you know, others in your organization, how have you made sure that you build a team where every person is aligned with you with the same purpose, same vision as each one of you cross the finish line every day? So that, I, I just have to be honest that that's a hard question for me because I think that, um, you know, I work really hard. Uh, I'm, you know, very focused on, you know, what I want to achieve at the end of this whole, you know, life for me. Um, I'm not one to ask for help. And so the idea of a team is something I am personally kind of still working on. Uh, but I will say that, you know, for most of my life, even more than the business, I've spent more of my life in community service, right? And I think that having worked in various volunteer organizations and, uh, and various um, community service initiatives, I think I've learned more about leading and team management uh, than I've ever learned in, in a company, right? Uh, because in a, in a volunteer organization, you have no control over anyone else's salary. You have no control over their grades. You have no ability to promote them or fire them. I mean, whether you like them or not, you have to learn to work together for a common purpose. And, you know, I like, so for example, when uh, I used to be the, the director of a youth camp in Houston uh, for, you know, for many years. And, you know, every year we'd have volunteers that were mostly high school students or college students and you know here I was only a few years older than them and I had to give them this vision right I had to make sure that you know that they were productive in this seven-day camp that everyone was on the same page that no child got hurt that the kids left happy right and so you have to I mean I can't do that for every single child that enters the camp and so it becomes very important that these counselors, these 30 counselors that are there for this hundred and something kids, that every single one of them understands this point, this idea that your happiness or your ego is secondary to the safety and the happiness of every child that's there, right? And so, you know, in, in our planning meetings, we'd have, you know, regular planning meetings leading up to the camp, this idea that, you know, what is our objective? What do we want to achieve? Why is that important, right? articulating that for a few minutes every meeting just to make sure that you know the camps went well and you know while while the camps were going on I mean they grew really fast every year the kids had a great time the counselors had a great time and it was all about we're working for a common purpose um, so uh, so to me I think it's really fascinating as you talked about you at that early age we're focused on, how every child should leave happy. I'm thinking if you put me in charge, I would have focused on losing no child on a given day 
And that would have been a big success for me. But seeing how you have processed and taken it to the next level and <clears throat> becoming back you know, serious again is, I really like that phrase, making your ego secondary. I think that is very important because to connect to a, pause, uh, to a bigger cause, you have to remove the I and the me and the ego out because otherwise you can't. So Raki, you talked quite a few times about nonprofits. It looks like nonprofits are an integral part of your life. Can you share a little bit about Seva International, how you got involved, and more importantly, under your leadership, some of the big impacts Seva made in recent times that you're really proud to share with us? Sure. So Seva International is uh, a 501c3 US-based humanitarian organization that is focused on improving humanity, serving society uh, in any way that it can. Right? We do this through a couple of areas. One is family services, second is promoting volunteerism, but the biggest area is assisting in disaster relief and recovery, um, not only here in the United States, but internationally. Uh, we have over 5,000 volunteers that are serving society, not only during this COVID pandemic, the local levels, such as the underserved or the, uh, the lower income areas, but you know, during the wildfires in California, the hurricanes in Houston, or the earthquakes uh, in Nepal or in, in Pakistan, uh, wherever it may be, we look to serve. And we look for ways to uplift the society uh, to bring some positive change, in, especially in areas where people have been hit by some type of disaster. Um, so I love that. So now let's get specific as the director of PR at Seva International. What has been some of the big impacts Raki and team has had in the last few years? So the PR side is one part, but I think actually the bigger impacts have been made by the common volunteers of Seva across the country. I mean, they're the ones that are serving on a day-to-day -day basis. When the pandemic hit in March of 2020, every single weekend they were serving, uh, they were doing grocery drives and food drives, hygiene kits, you know, delivering those to the areas that badly needed them, helping uh, the essential workers get PPEs when you know, they weren't available anywhere else. I mean, PR is only just kind of a, a way to let people know about it, but really the most amazing thing about SEVA is the, are the people that work day in and day out, look for ways to serve society and uplift the common man um, as they need that help. I love that. So, but I still want to go back to PR because you know it's a fashion area for me. Let's broaden it then SEVA. If tomorrow, Arjun or somebody else listening wants to run PR for a nonprofit, what are some key two or three nuggets that you would share with me that are very important in that journey forward? So uh, I think that probably the main thing is, uh, is the processes that are set up uh, in, uh, in any organization, uh, but especially in an organization like SEVA that's, you know, where the volunteers are actually less about the ego, they're less about the attention Media is very secondary to them in general, right? They're more focused on, uh, you know, serving society, and primarily because Seva International is a Hindu faith-based um, organization, and and they serve with this idea that as they serve society, they're serving a higher power, they're serving divinity, and so for them, they're not doing it for any selfish interest. They're not doing it for that attention. And so I think the biggest challenge, actually, with PR for an organization like Seva is first letting uh letting setting up a process by which media should be one part of it though it's not the guiding principle on anything that's done in seva but it's this idea that letting people know that there are selfless individuals like um the five thousand volunteers across uh the country that are looking for ways to serve right not only to expand the mission or the ability to serve to expand the opportunities to serve, uh, but to even let people know on the ground that there are uh, individuals like uh, uh, you know, uh, the volunteers in SEVA that are, that are there to help people like them, right? To give people hope. Thank you. So now let's take a step back. In your journey, both with SEVA, other nonprofits, you have been in boards, and of course, with the organization that you run, 
I know you have been in touch with amazing leaders who have helped you, shaped your life, career, and also made you smarter and wiser. Is there an individual you can talk about who has really helped you, one of the best leaders, and what makes you one of the best leaders in your life? So this is actually my favorite topic because I think uh, having been involved in a lot of volunteer organizations and community services, I have met some fantastic leaders. Uh, people who, like I said, are able to motivate other volunteers without having any control over anything that's you know, tangible, right? Their money or their position, their, you know, the ability to promote them or fire them or whatever. So you have these leaders that just have this innate ability to create a positive environment through which people want to serve, right? Or want to volunteer. Uh, and probably the best leader that I have come across, I mean, it's really, this is a very hard thing to kind of choose, but um, especially as a director of PR, um, the vice president that I work with, uh, it's a vice president of marketing and fund development, Sandeep Pradkikarji. He is uh, from Seva International. He's a volunteer himself. He's a, full, you know, he's a volunteer himself who's managing a group of mainly volunteers across the country, across the world, uh, in an area that's difficult to begin with, marketing and fund development. Because like I said, a lot of the, the people on the ground aren't really looking at these the softer aspects of an organization, of any organization. I mean, he's, he's completely selfless. He's uh, always willing to step in and help, always positive. He's always willing to be a sounding board to make sure that you're on the right. Th he's that grounding force uh, for all the volunteers that he manages. But the most impressive thing I think about him that is really kind of an inspiration even in, in my life is the idea that he's very focused on what his objectives are, right? The responsibility that he's been given, he's incredibly focused on achieving those goals, uh, not only for himself, but for everyone around him. He's always there to not only help support you in your role as you move forward, but also to make sure that you're just that you're doing well, right? That you know that that even while we serve Seva as we as well we serve society, that we are keeping a balance. Uh, so it's not just about Seva. It's not just about. It's about just the, the common humanity for all of us within us. I mean, he's really a leader that makes you want to work harder. You know, despite you know, no the money or whatever it is, just this ability to to want to give back more. And I think that's a big lesson in a nonprofit with volunteers. You cannot promise them promotion or raise because, you know, 100 percent raise over zero is still at zero. So I really think connecting to the cause and locking in, I think, is huge. So now let's make the conversation fun. Let's say Rocky walks into this place and meets two amazing human beings, and you realize one of them is 16-year-old Rocky and the other one is 100-year-old Rocky. So the first part is a very easy question. Where do you think this meeting will take place? And secondly, what is one thing each one of them tell the three Rocky, group of three Rockies? Huh, okay, that's interesting. Um, so uh, what would one tell the other? So I think the main thing is- First of all, where is this meeting going on? Where are you guys, where do you think this, if this meeting happens, where will it happen? Hmm, at a park. <laughs> so it's a park, got it. Okay. And um, so I think that for each of these levels, right? You have uh, a perspective that helps the next younger one, right? And so, you know, I think that at a hundred years old, that guidance, that bigger picture, uh, the things that maybe stressed you out at 30 or 40 or 50, you know, giving you that perspective that they really didn't matter, right? Mm -hmm. Second thing is that at me at this age, uh, talking to the 16 year old, uh, it's this idea that it's not the individual accomplishments that matter, it's not, like if I'm looking to, at a 16 year old in high school, it's not that one class that's gonna matter. It's not that one A that's gonna matter. It's not that one friend that's gonna matter, right? But it's overall, the overall tools that you create for your life, 
right? Like, and I tell high school kids this all the time. So that's, you know, it's an even easier question because I have this conversation with kids like, you know, multiple times a week. It's this idea that explore as much as possible, try everything, see what you like and what you don't like and collect tools in life, right? Brilliant, brilliant. And my approach on this is just the opposite of yours because I guess our lives are totally different. I'm very grateful to the 16 year old because everything the 16 year old did, he did plant the seeds that I'm reaping the benefits. And the same way, when I look at the 100 year old Arjun, I'm like, dude, you owe me because I keep you in the game. And I just think it's really unique to see how each one of us look at life totally differently. But it's a very fascinating concept on how you looked at and going back to individuals and making an impact. I really love that. So Raki, this has been a fascinating conversation. Okay, As we go through and just to bring everything together to wrap it and close it, is there anything we haven't talked about? And secondly, you know, you were very kind to answer every question. So if you have any questions at the end, you don't have to, but if you do, I would love to answer that too. Okay. Well, I guess the only thing that I would uh, mention was that, you know, um, I recently read your book, Wow, One More. And there's one thing that uh, has really, you know, kind of stood out for me, which uh, is probably the biggest lesson uh, mm -hmm. for all of us. Oh, that's something that we should keep in mind is this idea that, it, this was actually one of the, I mean, I saw this theme in a, many of them, but there was one, Blaine Hurst from Panera Bread, uh, in your interview of him, he said that he talks about his son running a 5K run, right? And how he created joy through that journey for everyone that run was- Run the running. race with joy. He ran the race with joy, right? And so it's this idea that no matter what we do, or what, where we go, or what we accomplish, or what may happen up or down. It's this idea that whatever we do should be a joyous journey, right? Those 87,000 moments in a day, you know, how do we maximize the amount of joy in each and every one of those moments um, as we move forward, right? How do we spread more joy? That's probably the, the biggest thing. Uh, no matter what field we're in, whatever industry we are, whatever we do, is that the goal should be the next moment should be a positive. Right? I love that. Absolutely. And then the question I have for you is that in all of this, I mean, these, these books and the podcasts and all this stuff is a, it's probably in many ways, the amplification of a really positive message. I mean, it's a great community service, right? So what is, uh, what is, what, what motivates you in, in all of this? So to me, I just think, you know, in life, it's easy to receive things. And it's also easy to receive things and just do a formal, hey, Rocky, thank you, and move on to the next moment of receiving more. And for me, in my 57 years of life, when I reflect back, I've started connecting the dot of how big the impact of everybody has been to get me every aspect of life to be here. A professor from Finland, when I met at Provo, Utah, he totally changed my life. Coming with engineering background, I wanted to be in operations because that's all I was seeing. This professor, Heiki Rene, kept telling me, Arjun, your mind is meant for marketing. Initially, I didn't take him seriously. It took him six to eight months. And I'm so grateful for somebody like Heiki who didn't get paid more. He didn't get any benefit, but he made a mission in life, as you're talking about, making an impact in every person's life. And the second part, what I realized was, you know, giving back starts with time. And that's the part where when I started looking at, and Clint and myself, Clint, you have met Clint McCaskill from my team, when we started looking at the podcast, the logo and the icon, I put half my face to remind me the impact I can make and the messages I can bring to others. It amplifies very easily when you have conversations with others, like the book, Wow, One More. 
if I had to write, if I'm really bragging, I could have got maybe 18% of that content at most on a given day. You know? But getting to 100% and putting all these 12 leaders together and seeing the commonality that every one of them have different paths, but their success is how do they get people to buy in, people to care about. You're talking about Blaine Hurst. You know, this is a story about Blaine I have never shared in public. He had hired me twice. Both times, he, as the CEO of the company he was running at that time, came to the airport to pick me up. And at the end of my interviews, he dropped me at the airport. Okay, that shows me that he is the kind of leader Sandeep is Caring is not a word because many a time we get caught into this world of sending my mom, I love you mom on Mother's Day. No, it's about every day what you do. And for Blaine, I'm serious. You know, he's retired, but tomorrow if he says, Arjun, you have to pay to play in my team, I'm going to beg, borrow, find money to pay and play in his team because that's what leaders do. I hope that answers your question. And, you know, that's the drive that, you know, sharing and thought leadership is a big thing now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you, I think that life is all about surrounding yourself with people that make you better, right? That make you uh, more positive or more happy or whatever it is. I mean, my husband is like that. Like I, you know, I've always told him, I think he makes me a better person. He makes me a happier person. Um, and you know, you you I think naturally we seek out people who do that to us, right? That can just improve our outlook, our life. I mean, that's what our goal is with our kids: is that if I can just shape their perception of life, that's probably the most important thing I can do for them. Absolutely, and I just I will disagree with you a little bit. Is you and I can't always choose, especially in your journey in the nonprofit world who will be around you. But you have total control on those 8,700,000 seconds on what energy you bring to the group. Because I really think that is the part where, you know, what I've learned with individuals like you, Sri Srinathji, amazing big brother to me, and what I've learned from him is we have total control in our reactions, our energy that we bring. And that I think changes the world. So I really feel that that is such a positive thing. And again, we just had to bring Sri Nadji in the conversation because he is such an, and Arunji, of course, both of them are amazing leaders in that journey. So Raki, this is a fascinating conversation. Truly appreciate this. Wish you and your husband, Nitesh, the very best in journey ahead. And of course the kiddos. And thank you again for taking time. Thank you, Arjun. I really, uh, really appreciate this opportunity. You've been listening to Secrets to Win Big with Arjun Sen, founder and CEO of Zen Mango, top brand growth driver and a former Fortune 500 executive who has been called one of the most marketing intelligent minds in the business. To learn more, visit www.zenmango.com. Share this podcast with your friends and subscribe wherever you like to listen to podcasts. 